How would you respond if right now you knew that God was asking you to do something big? Uh, something that's so big that's beyond your capabilities and even beyond your abilities. Would you step up or would you step back? Your answer could impact your faith. Stick around today as I explain how. It happened February 22nd, 2020. David Ayers was sitting in the stadium with his wife watching the hockey game between the Carolina Hurricane and the Toronto Maple Leafs. The whole reason David was in the stands that night was he was designated the emergency backup goalie for the Hurricane. <laughs> he was there just in the very unlikely event that both the goalies for the Hurricane got injured and he would have to be pressed into service. And wouldn't you know it, six minutes into the game, the starting goalie for the Hurricane went down with an injury. Partway through the second period, the, the backup goalie was involved in a collision. He, too, had to exit the game. And it was at that moment that David's phone started blowing up with text messages, informing him that he needed to go right away to the locker room to put on his equipment and get out onto the ice. So here was 42-year-old David Ayers, just 15 years removed from a kidney transplant, skating out onto the ice for the very first time to play in a professional hockey game. And he said as he was going out on the ice, he felt completely overwhelmed by the experience because the closest he had ever gotten to being in a professional hockey game prior to that night <laughs> was driving the Zamboni for the team's practice facility. And so there he was in the goal, completely unprepared, felt inadequate, uh, overwhelmed, in over his head. And he said it didn't take very long to figure out that he was in a place where he did not belong. And the first two shots that he faced ended up being goals. He said it all changed when a teammate came by and said, hey, we just want you to have fun tonight. We don't care if you let in 10 goals. Uh, we're just glad that you're out here. David said that's when it all changed, and uh, ultimately the Hurricane ended up winning the game, and David Ayers became the oldest starting or the oldest goalie in NA NHL history to win his debut. Now, uh, I have stories just like David Ayers that are very similar, those times in which I stepped out of my comfort zone and stepped into ministry. And those times in which it happened, I, I remember thinking very specifically, like, I uh, am not prepared <laughs> or I, I am really inadequate. And, and times in which I thought I just don't have the resources to minister in the ways in which God is asking me to minister. I remember those times when I ministered to someone or someplace in the name of Jesus. The very first time I was asked to lead the children's ministry at my church, and I felt completely unprepared. Or the time in which I was asked to lead a ministry team when I was in college, and I felt totally inadequate. Or the very first time I was asked to preach a sermon and I believed that I did not have what it took to minister in that way. Or the very first time I was asked to be a pastor of a church and I felt that I was too young. Now, probably just like me, there have probably been times in your life, if you've been a follower of Jesus for any length of time, where you have felt the nudge, the call uh, to, en to enter into a ministry. And you felt completely nervous and you felt like you were in over your head. You felt like you didn't measure up, that, that you were not going to be successful. And if you, like me, stepped into ministry despite all of those feelings, what you discovered was on the other side of that was that your faith got bigger. And it's amazing that when you and I step into ministry and we realize that God has used us to minister in the life of someone else, or when we step into ministry and we experience those moments when God gives us the right words to say at the right time in the right way, 
or those times in which God uh, allows us to leverage our past in order to help someone else move forward. There's something that happens, not just in the lives of the people that we minister to, but in our faith, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so today we are going to examine that in the life of of Moses, where we experience that call from God, and despite all of our reservations, we step into ministry. Maybe, maybe you have felt that call from God, and maybe you have stepped back instead of stepping up. Well, I want to encourage you today with this truth, and it's the take-home truth today, is that your availability is more important than your ability. You see, God isn't so concerned about your abilities as much as he is concerned about your availability. He just wants us to make ourselves available to him. And there are examples, there's illustrations all throughout the pages of Scripture of individuals that God was calling to step into ministry and, and they felt that they were inadequate. They, did, they just didn't think that they were enough, and you can just fill in the blank, that they felt that they were, not, uh, they were not young enough, or they felt that they were not old enough, or they felt that they were not smart enough, or they just didn't have enough of what it takes to minister in the capacity that God was calling them to minister. I think of Gideon, who when God called him into ministry, Gideon just simply responded by saying, Who? <laughs> Me? You, you, God, you just got the wrong Person, or I think of Jeremiah when God called him into ministry, and Jeremiah said, Oh God, I'm, I'm too young to do what you've called me to do. Or I just think about the disciples and, and how Jesus over and over again put, put them into seemingly impossible situations to see how they would respond. And all of them, what they discovered in their lives is the same thing that Moses discovered in his life that we're going to look at today is that availability is more important than ability. I started last week this series entitled, uh, on, on the life of Moses, entitled Experiencing God on the Journey. And, and just like Moses, and he takes this journey with God, he began to experience God in, in amazingly new levels. And at the, near the end of Moses' life there, it says that God would speak to Moses face to face as one friend would talk to another friend. And so my prayer, my hope is as we go through the life of Moses, that you would experience God in the same way. Last week, we started in Exodus chapters 1 and 2, and there we saw that God is always at work. And we can experience God's work in our life when we realize that God is up to something, even when we see nothing. And just kind of bring you up to speed to where we're going to pick up today is after Moses had been born, after he was raised, after he became an adult, and really the prince of Egypt at that point, he was out one day and he saw an Egyptian taskmaster, a slave driver, beating a Hebrew slave. And, he, and Moses, he looked around, he looked to the left, he looked to the right, uh, didn't think anybody was looking, and, and he killed the Egyptian and, and buried the Egyptian under the sand and, and thought he had gotten away with it. Uh, not long after that, he goes back out and he sees two Hebrew slaves that are fighting with one another. And Moses tries to intervene. And one of the Hebrew slaves says to Moses, says, are, are you going to kill me just like you killed that Egyptian? At that point, Moses realized that somebody witnessed what he had done. Word got back to Pharaoh about what Moses had done, and, and Pharaoh was seeking to destroy Moses. And so Moses runs away. He flees from Egypt, and he runs out to the wilderness to a place called Midian. And it's in Midian that he meets a young woman by the name of Zipporah, who ends up becoming Moses' wife. And there is Moses in the wilderness, working for Zipporah's father, Jethro, tending sheep. Here, he went from being the prince of Egypt to being a shepherd in the wilderness. And Moses found himself in that wilderness for 40 years, maybe thinking that he could forget about Egypt. Maybe he could forget about what was happening to his people. And there he was for 40 years just tending the sheep. But what Moses is going to discover really soon is that God is concerned about Moses' availability more than he is Moses' Ability. 
And so we pick it up in Exodus chapter 3. And the first six verses of chapter 3 are a story that's probably very familiar to you. Moses was kind of out. Just like it was every single day, tending the sheep, just going about business as usual. And then he saw something unusual. He saw a bush that was on fire. And what made this so unusual to Moses was that even though this bush was on fire, it wasn't consumed by the fire. And so Moses walked up to discover what was going on with this bush. And it's at that moment that he encounters God for the first time. And and God informs him that he is standing on holy ground. And so Moses had to take his sandals off and he approached the burning bush. And it's there that God introduced himself to Moses. And as we look at this this morning in Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush, what we see first is God's enlistment. That God has introduced himself to Moses, and now God is about ready to ask Moses to do something that Moses is going to believe is way beyond his abilities and even his capabilities. If you look in verse 7, it says this, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. I imagine uh, that Moses is standing there, and I just want you to linger over the words that God says here, that Moses is standing there, and he's attentive to all these words that God is speaking to him. Maybe Moses is shaking his head in agreement because here God says, he says, Moses, I want you to understand that I am, I have watched how my people have suffered. I've witnessed them crying every single night. Every time the the whip cracks on the back of my people, I I see that. And not only do I see it, but I've heard them crying over and over again. And not only that, Moses, but I am concerned about what's happening with my people. And maybe Moses, even though it's been 40 years removed, still has this attachment to the people. And maybe Moses is concerned as God is is concerned. And and maybe Moses is standing there saying, yeah, I'm glad you're concerned, God. And and God, I'm concerned about them as well. In verse 8, God says, So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And I I just imagine Moses having this internal conversation with himself saying, Yeah, God, I'm I'm glad you're concerned. I'm, I'm glad you're going to do something. And here God says, I'm going to bring them out from the bondage of slavery, and I'm going to take them into that land that I had promised, the land that he had promised to to Moses' forefather Abraham, and the land that he had promised to Isaac, the land he had promised to Jacob. And God here is telling Moses, I'm going to keep that promise. And Moses has to be thinking, that's great. I'm glad that you're finally going to do something about it. Now, it's important for us to understand that Moses hadn't read Exodus before. I mean, he was living it out. He had never seen Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments or Steven Spielberg's The Prince of Egypt. So Moses is not ready for what happens next. And what comes next in Moses' life probably comes as a shock or even at least just a jolt to Moses as Moses is thinking, yeah, I'm glad, God, that you're concerned. I'm glad you're going to do something in verse 10. It tells us, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. (laughs) Here, Moses is in the middle thinking, God, I'm glad that you're burdened for the people just as I'm burdened for the people. And now he is shocked to hear (laughs) that God has asked him to go and bring the people out of Egypt. And and the same is true for me and the same is true for you, that there are probably times in our lives when God has burdened our hearts for for people or for a, a ministry. Maybe God has burdened your heart for orphans. Or maybe God has burdened your heart for for just the tragedy of human trafficking that's going on in the world around us. Or maybe God has burdened your heart just to for your neighbor who needs to come to faith in Christ. And, and maybe you've been praying and asking God to, to do something about it. And maybe it's now that God is calling out to you. Maybe you're having a burning bush experience and he's saying, yeah, I'm concerned. And I'm sending you to go for me. And you may be like Moses, but I want you to understand today that your availability is more important 
than your ability. Because what we see next is Moses' excuses. And what happens in these next several verses is a conversation that Moses has with God. And it's a conversation where Moses is trying to use these excuses to escape this call that God had just given to him to go and to bring the people out of Egypt. And as we look at these excuses, they may be excuses that sound familiar to you because maybe they're excuses that you have used with God when he has asked you to step into ministry. And the first excuse that Moses uses is that he is inadequate. If you look in verse 11, so God calls Moses in verse 10 and verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Here Moses is saying, I'm I'm inadequate. I mean, God, have you looked at my resume? Do you know that I'm just a dusty shepherd who's been living out here in the wilderness for 40 years? I mean, what standing do I have that I can go to the, to the king of Egypt? I'm just inadequate. And, and maybe you use that excuse as well. But listen to what God says in verse 12. And God said, I will be with you. God is saying, Moses, your availability is more important than your ability. You may think that you are inadequate, but it doesn't matter because I am with you. And what he says here is that Moses' competence is not as important as God's presence. And maybe you feel inadequate today for whatever it is that God is asking you to minister, whatever way in which God is asking you to minister. But remember that God's presence overwhelms your competence. And your availability is more important than your ability. But Moses doesn't stop there. He gives God another excuse, and this is the excuse of ignorance. If you look in verse 13, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Here Moses simply saying, God, I don't have all the answers. What if they ask me something that I don't know? What if they talk to me and, and, and when they ask me this question, I just, you know, I, I don't know how to respond to it. And God responds to Moses and he, says, he said to Moses, I am who I am. Now, now, this name that God gives to Moses is the name that's translated today, Yahweh, and it's, it's oftentimes referred to as the personal, the intimate, the close name of God. It's kind of like a name that you would use with somebody that you're really close with. And the point here is that he's saying to Moses, he's saying, Moses, you know me. You may not know the answers, but you know me who is the answer to all the questions. And then if you were to read through verses 15 15 on, what God is going to do there, he's just going to simply give Moses the words that he is to say. He's going to tell Moses, just go and tell them this and tell them this and tell them this. And that's why it's so important for you and I, when we're involved in ministry, to have our personal quiet time. Because it's through our Bible reading and our prayer life that we really know God And we know God's word. And when we know God and when we know God's word, we are prepared for the ministry that God has called us to undertake. But Moses doesn't stop there. He gives a third excuse. And his third excuse is, what if I'm ineffective? If you jump over to chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered, If they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you. Moses is basically saying, God, what if? What if when I go there, it's, it's a disaster? Like, uh, what, if, what if I am just a dumpster fire? What if it's a flop? What if I'm unsuccessful in what you have asked me to do? Now, what God does next here is so interesting to me. It's so uh, just, just amazing what God does. And what he tells Moses, he says, Moses, throw your staff down on the ground. And Moses threw it down on the ground and it turned immediately into a snake. And then God said, all right, reach down and grab the, grab the snake by the tail. And he grabs the snake by the tail. And as soon as he picks it up, it turns back into a staff. Then God says, Moses, I want you to take your hand and I want you to put it inside your shirt. When he, and now pulled out, and when he pulled it out, his hand was covered with leprosy. 
And then God said, put it back in your shirt. He put it back in his shirt. He pulled it out again, and his hand was returned to normal. And why I find that so fascinating is because Moses is saying, God, what if I'm ineffective? What if I'm not successful in what you've called me to do? And hear what God is saying. He's saying to Moses, Moses, I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm asking you to be faithful to me. And then when you're faithful to me, then I will do what only I can do. You see, in our lives, faithfulness equals success. As long as you and I are faithful to God, that is the definition of success in God's eyes. Because God will take care of the rest. I, my, one of my favorite sayings is, hey, that's God's problem. <laughs> you know, you and I are to, to be faithful and do whatever God has asked us to do. The rest is his problem. And he's big enough to take care of those problems. But however, Moses isn't done there. And he offers a fourth excuse. And he says, what if I'm inept? If you look in verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, O Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And here Moses is saying, God, I just can't say the words that you want me to say. Some people think it's educational. Where Moses is saying, God, I just don't have the education to debate Pharaoh. I mean, he's the most powerful man in the world. Some people think it's psychological that Moses has that fear like a lot of people have. God, I just can't speak in front of people. Like, I can't, don't even ask me to do that. Some people think it was a verbal problem where maybe what he'd been removed from Egypt for so long that maybe he forgot the Egyptian language. And he's saying to God, God, I, I just can't speak that language anymore. Or maybe some people are saying it's just vocal where he had a stuttering problem or some sort of speech impediment. And God, I just I, the words just don't come out clear. And God's response to Moses is really twofold to this excuse. First of all, he says to Moses, he said, the excuse that you've just offered to me, first of all, is irreverent. If you look in verse 11, the Lord said to him, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And so he's basically saying to Moses, Moses, when you use that excuse with me, what you're saying is I have not done what was right. God says, hey, I'm the one who made your mouth. I'm the one who gave you your tongue. And I'm the one who called you. So what your, your excuse here is irreverent. But also the second part of this, he tells Moses, your excuse is irrelevant. If you look at verse 12, he says, now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Like Moses, your excuse here is irrelevant because I am going to give you the words to say. I am the one who's going to help you to speak and to just say the words that I need you to say. However, Moses isn't done. And this fifth one maybe isn't really an excuse as it is maybe the heart of all of his excuses. And this is just the fact that Moses is indifferent in verse 13, Moses said, O oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. God, I just don't want to do it. You, you just go ahead and send someone else. Now, all of those excuses you and I have probably used with God. When he's asked us to step into ministry, maybe you thought you are inadequate Maybe you thought you are ignorant that you, what, you know, what if you just don't have the right word? What if you, they ask you something that you don't know the answer to? Maybe you think you'll be ineffective, that, that you'll just fail. Maybe you think you're inept, that you just can't say what you need to say. Or maybe you're just indifferent. But your availability is more important than your ability. Ralph, uh, during a storm, he had a tree that fell over his driveway and uh, needed to get it cut up. So he went to his neighbor who owned a chainsaw and he knocked on his neighbor's door and he asked his neighbor, he said, can I borrow your chainsaw? And his neighbor said, well, I'm eating black eyed peas. And Ralph asked again, he said, uh, well, I have this tree that fell over in the storm and I need to get it cut up. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm just asking you if I can borrow your chainsaw. And his neighbor said, well, uh, I would really like to, but I'm eating black eyed peas. <laughs> and Ralph said to his neighbor, he says, well, what does eating black eyed peas have to do with you loaning me your chainsaw? And his neighbor looked at Ralph and said, well, if you don't want to loan your neighbor a chainsaw, one excuse is as good as another. <laughs> 
And, and here you can use whatever excuse that you want with God, but what God is going to say to you, your availability is more important than your ability. Because there's, the time is going to come when you and I are going to have those burning bush moments in our life. And God is going to ask us to step in or to step out or to step up. And we're going to feel that nudge from God to be involved in ministry. That nudge from God to invite our coworker to come to church with us. That nudge from God to be involved in some ministry at the church. That nudge from God to lead a small group. The nudge from God to, to go on a missions trip for the very first time. Maybe even just a nudge from God to go across the street and share our faith with our neighbor. And when those moments come, the excuses are going to come with it. And we're going to say, I don't have all the answers. I don't have the abilities. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know the hows or the whys of, of what you've asked me to do, God. But when those times come, it's our opportunity to do something big with God. You see, God is in the business of doing things big, and he's asking us to participate with him. And it may be something big in your church. It may be something big in your community. It may just simply be something big in the life of your friend, your relative, your associate, or your neighbor. And you're going to have a choice at that moment when you come upon that burning bush where you can either step out in faith or you can step back with your excuses. And so I want to encourage you when those moments happen in your life to serve without hesitation. Over in Hebrews in chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, it says this. It says, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. You see, God doesn't always call the equipped, but he always equips those he calls. And so just simply, sir, simply minister without hesitation. And there's a couple things here that I would encourage you to do. Number one, just discover your shape. We, we use that acronym. It stands for spiritual gifts, heart, ability, personality, experiences. If you're a believer in Jesus, you have a spiritual gift that God has given to you that he wants to use. Our heart is those things that we're passionate about, uh, causes or people groups that we are just passionate about. What, what's the things that you're passionate about? And then your abilities. You may think that you don't have abilities, but all of us have some sort of ability. And your personality that God has given to you that he wants to use specifically in some special ways and your experiences. Those experiences that have happened in our past and, and typically the, the painful experiences that God wants to use to minister in the lives of other people. So just simply discover your shape. We have a class here at the church that we have. There's, there's resources on the internet to help you discover your shape. And then number two is just simply deploy into ministry. Just simply take that step of faith. And, and as the excuses and the fears and the anxieties and the questions and the apprehensions start to take over, just simply say, I'm, I'm not going to listen to those voices. I'm going to step out in faith and minister for the cause of Jesus. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 18, after Moses had offered all these excuses, it says this, Then Moses went back to Jethro's father-in-law and said to him, Let me go back to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. You see, Moses, in the end, ended up going. And when Moses went, he experienced God in a way in which he had never experienced him before. And if you, we, we, and here we are several thousand years later, and when we have those burning bush moments in our lives, when we say yes, you are going to experience God in a way you had never experienced him before. And what will happen is your faith will grow. However, you may hesitate and you may say no because of whatever excuse you want to use. 
What happens there is your faith is going to shrink. It's going to atrophy. It's going to get weak. So God is asking you to step out in faith and minister. And when you do that, you're going to experience God's power in your weakness. Look at what Moses experienced in his life. (laughs) He experienced God and those plagues that he brought upon the Egyptians. As he's standing at the shore of the Red Sea, he experienced the power of God parting the Red Sea. He experienced the power of God who who provided manna and and water to the people miraculously and how they, even though they were wandering through the wilderness for 40 years, their clothes, their shoes never wore out. He experienced the power of God even in his weaknesses. And you can experience the same. Your availability is more important than your ability. So if you want to grow your faith, when you experience those burning bush moments in your life, say yes. And listen, you're never going to be ready. You're never going to have all the answers. You're never going to feel that you're adequate enough. You're never going to think that you have the abilities. You're never going to really believe that you have what it takes. You're going to think that you're way in over your head. But here's the truth. The people who, who experience those moments and in spite of all of their excuses say yes, they're the people that have changed lives and in many cases have even changed the world. The people that say no are the people that we never hear from again because your availability is more important than your ability. So I want to encourage you to step out in faith. When God calls you, when you have that burning bush moment and God is nudging you to to share your faith, when God is asking you to minister in your church, when God is asking you to minister in your community, to say yes, because in the end, you'll be glad that you did. There was a guy in my church when I was the pastor in Erie, Pennsylvania, and we were driving along one day, and I was just talking to him, and I said to him, I said, hey, I, I'm going to ask you to preach sometime. And when I asked him that, he looked at me, and he almost fell out of the car. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 there's no way I could do that. I said, no, nah, I think you have the skills, the abilities, the talents to do it. And so uh, I said, I'll work with you. And so we worked together, and I remember the first time that he, He preached his very first sermon and afterwards just how excited he was to see God working in his life. What happened later on is he became a leader in a church. He was leading small groups. He was leading classes and he would he would fill in and and give messages all the time. And he became a great man of faith. All because he was willing to say yes in spite of all of the feelings of inadequacy that he had. And what he discovered is what Moses discovered, and it's what you will discover if you will say yes to God, is that your availability is more important than your ability. God, I thank you for your word today. I pray for those who are feeling a little apprehensive about stepping out in faith to minister in ways in which you have been leading them. God, I pray that they would understand that their availability is more important than their ability. And they would just simply be faithful to what you have asked them to do. And on the other side of it, that they would experience the power of you, your power working in their weakness. May we do this all for the sake of Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to see you soon.